opportunity to be here today. I'd also like to thank all of you all for coming. I know there's many ways to spend a Saturday afternoon, and by choosing to be here for my debut public speaking, <laughs> it means a lot. Um, my wife told me to make up a joke and insert it here, but if I could write jokes, I'd be on Comedy Central. <laughs> so, I'll get started. Uh, my name is Casey Pointer. I'm 30 years old, 30 years old, 30 years old, father to a beautiful three-year-old girl, married to my best friend, and I'm a stay-at-home dad, and I've had cancer for the last four years and five days. I'm here today to talk with you all about my experience with our country's health care system and give you my opinion why I think as a country we can do better. I will tell you a little bit about my diagnosis, treatment, medical costs, Medicare, and hopefully by the end I will accomplish what I came here to do. Every year, 45,000 people will die simply because they do not have health care coverage, and I could have easily been one of those unfortunate ones. Four years ago, I was your average 26-year-old guy who put off going to the doctor because I didn't want the expensive medical bills <coughs> and figured my body could fix itself. In August of 2005, I was in Sturgis, South Dakota at the world's largest motorcycle rally where I should have been partying and having the time of my life. But instead, I was extremely tired and just wanted to sit in my room and rest. I had gained about 20 unexplained pounds over the summer, all in my belly. My wife and I had an ongoing joke about my belly keeping up with hers during a pregnancy. <laughs> uh, on September 28, 2005, my wife rushed me to the St. Joseph emergency room at about 2 in the morning because I was in extreme pain and vomiting putting off to the doctor had finally caught up to me. Not to mention, it was my three-year wedding anniversary and the hospital was the last place I wanted to spend it. My wife can tell you better about what happened that next 24 hours, but what I know is I was diagnosed with liver cancer. The doctors drained 27 liters of blood and pus from my abdomen and they were telling me I needed to go home and get my affairs in order because I had less than 12 months to live. You can't imagine how scared both my wife and I were because she was eight months pregnant at the time. Instead of celebrating our marriage and preparing for our new baby, we were trying to get an appointment at the Mayo Clinic so the best of the best oncologists could tell me how I ended up with cancer. I've never been a heavy drinker and was in pretty good shape, except for the big belly thing. <laughs> Over the next four years, I had an array of treatments, including testicular, liver, colon, and even ovarian cancer treatment. My case is unique because I've been seen by some of the best doctors in the world, and still, nobody really knows what's wrong with me. If I had to guess, I'd probably run up about $10 million in medical bills to date, and I still have an unknown cancer. My experience with the healthcare system is also unique because I'm one of the lucky ones that got crucial, tr crucial treatment in those first months. Before becoming a stay-at-home dad because of my cancer, I had my dream job selling building materials to builders and remodelers, and I was starting to make some real money. I was working for a small family-owned business, and if it weren't for this company and family, my wife would be, would be a widow and my daughter would be without her daddy. Let me explain to you why I feel this way. Seven days after I was diagnosed, I went on short-term disability, and I have not worked since. My job became going to chemotherapy and staying alive. After six months of disability, employers are able to terminate your employment. So six months after diagnosis, I could have been dropped from insurance and not eligible for Medicare for another 18 months. COBRA insurance is available, but with no income and no way to pay for my, and no way to pay for my treatment, my situation could have turned dire in a hurry. Instead of letting me go without health care coverage and no way to pay for my treatment, my employer kept me on the company's insurance plan for the two years I needed before I was eligible for Medicare. This is very rare that a company keep you on insurance simply because it's the right thing to do. Fewer and fewer employers are even offering health care benefits, let alone paying for someone that technically doesn't even work for them anymore. Thanks to their kindness, I was able to receive the crucial care that I would have otherwise not been able to afford. Had I been working in corporate America, I can guarantee I would have been dropped as soon as possible. Our country is in desperate need for more employers like this, but it should not be our small business owners carrying the weight of our civic 
and I will forever be grateful to them. Another major factor to my being alive are the doctors and nurses I have. Due to my rare diagnosis of an unknown primary cancer, all the treatments I have received are considered experimental, therefore not covered by my insurance. In order to get the medicines and care I need and deserve, the oncologists that treat me have to manipulate the system in order to get me the treatment that I need. Uh, without their knowledge and experience, I am sure I would have been denied most of the chemotherapy, radiation, and surgeries that I've received. And moving on to Medicare Part D, the prescription drug plan that people with Medicare, the people with Medicaid get. This system has something called the donut hole, which is when your prescription costs exceed the limit allowed by the plan and the, and the patient becomes responsible for their prescription costs out of pocket. This year, I fell into the donut hole in April, leaving me with the expense of my medicines. And just to give you an example, one of my prescriptions costs $600 a month, and another is $200. This is an, an, an expense and decision our seniors and the fortunate people under 65 with Medicare must make every day of their lives, food or medicine. This is obviously not an easy decision. Live in pain and sickness or go hungry. And with the rising cost of pharmaceuticals, it is only going to get worse. In a perfect world, the cure to cancer will be discovered, and I will beat this and go on and live a long and happy life. Let's think about that for a minute. Say I am cured, and then what? I will not be able to get insurance ever again due to my high risk and pre-existing condition. I won't be able to afford my medicines or go to follow-up visits or have the tests done that I need. American medicine is too expensive without insurance. But as you all know, it is not a perfect world. I will go on fighting and trying to live my life to the fullest and cherish every moment I, I'm here with my family and friends. Opponents to the health care have a laundry list of reasons why health care reform isn't needed or will not work. But the one that gets to me most is, I pay for my insurance, why should I pay for everybody else's also? I don't understand that argument, and I honestly don't think the people that make it understand it either. We are all paying for the uninsured as it is. With people not going to the doctor at the first sign of a problem and letting their health go until they are forced to go to the emergency room, very similar to what I did, if I had not been admitted to the hospital, I would have left the ER with about $10,000 of debt because my insurance didn't cover emergency room visits. For many that are not admitted, all of us taxpayers absorb this cost. We do not have to treat our sick as a commodity. 17% of our national economy is spent on the healthcare industry. Healthcare should not be looked at as an industry or a way to get rich. We have lives and families and people that want us around. And I don't deserve better care over the next person just because I make more money than them or vice versa. Americans should not receive health care due to the size of their paychecks or even their employment status. Aren't we supposed to be the greatest nation on earth? And is that really what the lesson we want to teach our children and what happened to love your neighbor? Five years ago, I may have been one of those arguing that point, but I have realized we are all in this together, and at some point in life, everybody is going to need some help. Wouldn't you like to be one of those that help make it better for the generations to come? I know I would.